Well, it's uh, <laughs> really good to be here. After uh, 20 days of quarantine, it's actually good to be anywhere, okay, <laughs> and uh, beyond the walls of my house. So it's really good to be here. We are better together. Uh, that's uh, the theme uh, for these weeks. And, and last week, we began by talking about God's desire for his people to be in community. That's his desire. Now, that doesn't mean that God is uh, disinterested in having a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with us. I mean, there is power in solitude. Uh, removing ourselves from the things of this world and, and just alone encountering the living God in his word through prayer and, and, and meditation. In, in fact, if you, if you go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, you will see that there are several instances where, where Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one interaction with an individual. So in John chapter 3, he has this one-on-one -on -one interaction with a guy named Nicodemus. Go to the next chapter, chapter 4, one-on-one -on -one meeting with a, a woman by a well in a place called uh, Samaria. It was just the two of them, one-on-one. -on -one. It was a personal time with Jesus. And, and today, many of us, we, we call it personal uh, devotions. It may be a Bible study that you're making your way through online, or it may be a, a devotional, a daily devotional such as daily bread or, or portals of prayer. And you consider it your alone time with Jesus, and, and you look for no uh, interruptions. Uh, at this time, you really want to be away from community, away from other people, and that's okay. It, it, you, you are truly blessed when you're alone with the living God. But understand, this God who desires these intimate one-on-ones, he has also called us into the community of believers. And part of that community here at Hope, uh, we call Hope groups, a group of 12 people, sometimes more, sometimes less, who, who gather together to read and study God's Word, uh, to pray together, and to encourage one another. And I really believe from God's perspective, it's not an either-or, but it's a both-and. He, he wants to spend time with us alone and he wants to spend time with us when we gather together with the community of the forgiven. And that community, uh, it is both a, a smaller group of individuals, talked about that, but it's also a larger group uh, of worshipers. And, and again, here at Hope, the smaller group we call Hope Groups. The larger group, we, we call it worship. And again, when it comes to these two, it's not an either or. I believe with God it is a both end. And so it's interesting. Again, just go through the Gospels, and, and you see how Jesus interacted with people. There were times when he interacted one-on-one. -on -one. There are times when he interacted with the 12, the small group, and there were times when he interacted with a large group. Individual, small group, large group. And to help illustrate this, I just want to take a little trip through the New Testament book of Acts. But before, before we get to these verses, I believe that the church has to decide whether the book of Acts, is it just a history book? Or, or is it the living God speaking to 21st century believers? You, you see, if it's just a history book, and a lot of people look at it that way, you read the book of Acts and you go, that's nice how the people 2,000 years ago, how, how they celebrated their Christian faith, that's nice. But if it is the living and active Word of God, and I believe it is, then what the Apostle Paul says about the entire Scriptures, it's then true of the book of Acts as well. So here's what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, All Scripture is God-breathed, 
and it is useful for four things, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So God has included the book of Acts in the New Testament in the Bible in order to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train the church, the people of God. And so here we go. Let's start with Acts chapter 1, verse 15. This is God speaking to this present generation. The verse says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Okay, so Jesus died. He came back to life. He ascended into heaven, right? And at this point, when Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, close to that point, the Bible says there are about 120 believers in the city of Jerusalem. Out of how many? Well, it's a lot of controversy as to how many people lived in the city of Jerusalem during this time. Uh, the, 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 you've got to remember that it, quite often it would fluctuate, especially before, during, and after the major festivals. Sometimes the city was inundated with people and the population would arise. But a conservative estimate has the city of, of Jerusalem, the population, at about one 100,000 people. 100,000 people in the city of Jerusalem, and there's only 120 who believed in Jesus. But it changes. Next verse, Acts 2, verse 41. It says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. On a day called Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled these early Christians with incredible power, Peter preaches a sermon, and apparently it was a really, really good sermon because the Bible says 3,000 people were baptized and they were added to the church. Amazing. Now, in America today, the average size of a congregation is about 120 people. We would consider uh, a mega church to be, you know, in the thousands, 3,000 people. And so the question is, how long does it take to, to go from an average-sized congregation to a megachurch when God is involved? It can take just one day. So you go from 120 to 3,000 people in one day. Next verse, Acts 2.47, it says of the early believers that they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It says that the Lord added daily. If one person was added on a day after one year, you have now another 365 believers. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, next verse. It says, many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. That doesn't include the women and the children. And so a lot of people believe at this point, and it's still pretty early in the life of the church, many people believe that there were about ten to 15,000 believers in the city of Jerusalem. And then it gets even more exciting. Acts chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. The King James Version English Standard Version, it's a better translation because instead of more and more, it has the word multitudes. It's like somebody was in charge of counting all the Christians in Jerusalem. His name was Joe, probably, and he's counting one, two, three, four, five, six. And, and then somebody says, Joe, how many are there? And he goes, I don't know, lots. And, and so Dr. Luke, he simply writes, multitudes now in the city of Jerusalem. Well, it gets even better. Acts chapter 5, verse 28, uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders, they're, they're kind of upset as to what is going on in the city of Jerusalem with all these Christians. And so the high priest, he speaks to the followers of Jesus, and he says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Now, he's referring to the name of Jesus. You're not supposed to be teaching in the name of Jesus. Yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And again, you got about 100,000 people in the city of Jerusalem. 
the church went from 120 to 3,000 to 15,000 to a multitude. And now the high priest says, you filled the city with, with those who, who humbly bowed before the, the name of Jesus Christ. And then there's one more verse, Acts 6, verse 7. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And now Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he simply says, hey, the church was growing rapidly. The guy in charge of counting, he, he gave up a long time ago. And even the religious elite, who so opposed Jesus Christ, now they too were humbly bowing and declaring his name. Could you imagine if at Acts chapter 6, if COVID-19 had come to that community, the city of Jerusalem, just think about it. If these Christians were to socially distance, you would have to move the walls of the city of Jerusalem one mile in every direction so that all the believers would fit in that place. So a good question is, you've got all these people, and it's, it's growing rapidly, and it didn't take very much time. Where did they meet? Um, wh where did they gather together? Well, Acts chapter 5, verse 42 supplies the answer. It says, day after day, in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So first of all, it says that they met in the temple courts. These were large spaces that surrounded the temple proper. And, and you can imagine that these were large gatherings of believers where they worshipped. And, and boldly they proclaimed the message, the good news about Jesus Christ. But then the Bible says they also met from house to house. And, and their houses weren't that big back then, and so these had to be smaller gatherings. And to tell you the truth, many of these early Christians, they had a Jewish background. And, and so they would have been used to that, gathering in a house, because one of their major festivals, Passover, that's exactly what they would do. They, they would gather in, in their homes. And so you had these early Christians, they're, they're meeting in large gatherings, in the temple courts, and they're also meeting in a smaller group right in their home. And you get the impression that it wasn't an either-or, but a both-end. I mean, go back. I believe that these believers, they had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's absolutely true, without a doubt. But the Bible says they also met in a smaller group in their homes, and they met in a larger group in the temple courts. And something amazing and powerful was happening. Check it out. Yeah, yeah they grew numerically, and, and the growth is absolutely astounding. But if you go through the book of Acts, if you begin actually in the Gospels, and you go through the book of Acts, you see a bunch of fear-filled, timid believers suddenly growing spiritually by leaps and bounds becoming the people that God wanted them to be. I and mean, if you're in Acts chapter 6, go back to Acts chapter 2, and I believe that God gives us a snapshot of this early church and its remarkable beauty. I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. And as I read, just pick out the spiritual aspects uh, of this congregation, of these Christians. Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord 
added to their number daily those who were being saved. And there you see it again. They, they met in the temple courts, large gathering. They, they met in their homes, small gatherings. And you see these believers and their spiritual strength. I mean, they didn't just listen to the teaching of the apostles. They didn't just encourage one another. They didn't just celebrate the Lord's Supper. They didn't just pray. But there are words like devoted and sincere and glad used to describe their spiritual lives. Hey, these Christians, they were filled with awe. They, they sold their possessions in order to give money to the poor. And people generally liked them. They were Christians and people on the outside liked them because it says that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Folks, spiritually speaking, they were better together. And we can look at this. We can look at the book of Acts and we can say, boy, it'd be great to be a part of a congregation like this. Boy, it would be great to have that kind of growth in our community. Well, remember, these words from the book of Acts, they're not just a historical record. They are the living words that God desires to use in order to teach us. At times to, to rebuke us and correct us. At times to train us. And, and very simply, if, if this is something we desire as a people and as a congregation, then understand this New Testament growth, numerically, spiritually, it necessitates God's New Testament methodology. And so if you would allow me, I would love to share with you what I see will be an incredible blessing for this congregation. And I want to begin at the individual level. Beginning on September the 27th, many of you, I, I hope, uh, you're going to participate in a challenge we're calling Just What the Doctor Ordered. We're going to be going through the, the New Testament book of Luke. And uh, Luke was written by a doctor, Dr. Luke. And that's why we're calling it Just What the Doctor Ordered. You, you can register now, but the challenge begins on September 27th, and it runs to the end of the year. And there are five parts to this challenge. Challenge number one, we're going to challenge people to read through the Gospel of Luke. Now, you can read it in one day, one evening. It's easy. But we're going to provide a reading guide so that people can get through challenge number one, read the Gospel of Luke. Challenge number two, watch the, the movie uh, Jesus. It's, it's a movie that's being used by missionaries around the world to share the message of Jesus Christ. And we're going to encourage people to have their Bibles opened as they go through challenge number two because the movie Jesus follows the Gospel of Luke. And, and so, so you're going to be reading the, the Gospel of Luke, challenge one. You're, you're going to be watching the Gospel of Luke, challenge number two. And then challenge number three, we're, we're going to challenge people to complete a 20-part a a Bible study that's going to be provided uh, for you. And, and again, we're going to provide all kinds of resources, links, and, and Bible study resources. But you're going to be reading the Gospel of Luke, watching the Gospel of Luke, and then doing a 20-part Bible study. And then number four, uh, this is the one many people are going to be really challenged. We're going to challenge you to memorize 24 verses from the, the Gospel of Luke. And I know a lot of people, they're going to say, I, I just can't do that anymore. We're going to provide helps just to help people to memorize one verse from every chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And then challenge number five, we're going to challenge you to live out the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be looking at three different passages in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus, I believe, challenges the people of God. And we're going to challenge you to live out uh, those verses. Isn't it an incredible goal to have all our people love and know God's Word so that we would be so saturated with Scripture that we couldn't help but talk about it, share it, and apply it. And I believe that, yes, this is an individual challenge 
But if we talk about it with one another, like what we're learning and how we're growing and how we're being challenged, and if we encourage one another to press on, to finish it by the end of the year, I believe we will be better together. From the individual uh, level, we move to the small group of individuals we call hope groups. I would love for every person who calls hope home to, to check it out. But first of all, uh, then to, to take that step and to join one. I would love for the people who already are in a group, I would love for you folks to invite people. Fill your hope group so that we would have to create even more hope groups. Folks, there is something about being in a group of 12 to 14 people that you're not going to experience on your own. And you're not going to experience in, in a larger group setting such as worship. For example, Towards the end of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about end times, about the return of Jesus Christ, and uh, how we're going to be taken uh, with Jesus to, to glory. And I had to believe that as the Apostle Paul shared these words, that there was a little bit of fear and apprehension with those early Christians. Just as there may be some fear and apprehension with us today because of the uncertainty. We didn't really know how it's going to happen. And so Paul, he writes these words to the early Christians, and these words are shared with us uh, today. And you get to the end of chapter 4, verse 18, and there's just this one simple verse. Paul says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And, and, and personally speaking, and a lot of people who are in a, a hope group can attest to this, it may be one of the greatest blessings of being in a hope group it, is that you are encouraged. I mean, you read and you study parts of the Bible, but then you have an opportunity to encourage one another because, hey, we're on a spiritual journey, w wanting to draw closer to the God who made us to the Savior who redeemed us. You need that encouragement. In a smaller group, you are blessed in a way that, that you can then in turn bless somebody else. Folks, we are better together. You can sign up online and the next session begins on September the 27th as well. From the uh, individual uh, to the um, hope groups, we move to the large group worship. Folks, I can't believe that it's been six months since we've worshiped without masks. There is something that you will experience in worship that you're not going to experience on your own. And you're not going to experience in a small group of individuals. And I experienced it today sitting right there. And that's the corporate raising of voices. Really what happened here today is a, a foreshadowing of eternity. When the multitudes from every tribe and nation, people and language will, will come before Jesus Christ and with a loud voice declare salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and, and to the Lamb. I, I, I believe that, that it's been an incredible blessing, don't get me wrong, these past few months, being able to, to watch the services online. We praise God for the technology that, that He has given us, but ultimately, ultimately, we are better together in one place, lifting up our voices, and that's what I see. And that's what I pray for. Individuals, hope groups, a worship com community so saturated with Scripture that we can't help but talk about it, share it, and apply it. Folks, I know that I'm on the back end of my ministry. That there are way more days behind me than ahead of me. So what will I do with those remaining days? And I can think of no better response than what the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. He said, He, that is Jesus, 
is the one we proclaim. That's what I want to do for the rest of my days. Paul says, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That's my desire as a pastor, is this to teach and proclaim that you would know Jesus better, that he would not only be a word spoken, but a Savior who reigns and lives in your heart. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Whatever power he gives me, whatever strength he gives me, I'm going to say Jesus until that day he says, you're done. And then I'm going to look at him and I'm going to say Jesus for eternity. Well, folks, I just encourage you to take a step would you, and go through this challenge with the Gospel of Luke. I, I encourage you to join a hope group. I encourage you to, to join together for worship with the expectation that soon, very soon, we'll all be back here without wearing any masks. We are better together. It will be a blessing. And you, in turn, will be a blessing to a hurting world. We bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for the book of Acts. Lord, uh, remind us that as we go through those verses that you're teaching us, you're rebuking us, you're correcting us, we need that. You're training us. You're shaping us to be the people you want us to be. So, Father, we pray for this congregation. We, we, we pray, Lord, for this community of the forgiven, this community of believers. We just pray. That, that we would just draw closer to you as you draw close to us. And that as individuals, we will grow in our one-on-one -on -one relationship with you, that we will seek you every day. We pray, Lord, that many will take up that challenge and, and just be so saturated with the gospel of Luke by the end of the year that uh, you will make us different for having done it. We pray, Lord, that more and more would desire to be in that, that small group of individuals where, where, where we could encourage one another to press on, to, to, to keep on growing in our, our spiritual walk. And then, Lord, we pray for, for our worshiping community, whether it be in person now or online, we just pray that, that we would worship you with abandonment, that, that we would see you as the Savior and the Lord of our lives, that you are most worthy of our praise. Lord, one day for eternity, we're going to be singing that song, Worthy is the Lamb, and we just pray that we would sing it now. Lord, that it would be upon our hearts and on our lips. That, that we would declare the name of Jesus. R remind us, Lord, in all of this, that we are better together. And Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, before we continue on... Um, uh, this upcoming week, I know that there are a lot of kids that are going to be returning to, to school, and, and I know that uh, there are some have already returned. We're talking about college university students as well, and boy, it's a whole lot different, isn't it, than in years past. Uh, before, you just had to make sure your kids had crayons and a pencil and a ruler, and now you need to make sure they have a mask and know what social distancing is all about, and and, and these are times where there may be uh, a little bit of fear, maybe a whole lot of fear and apprehension. So we thought it best that we would just come before the Lord in a time of prayer and just pray for teachers and pray for students uh, that it would be a great year. Let's bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, you know what is happening. And you know how different it is this September from previous years. and So, Lord, we're just asking right now, in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you would watch over all of those teachers who are preparing right now to go back to school, those who have already returned. Lord, um, we've asked them to teach our kids. And, uh, Lord, uh, may that still be their, their focus, but there's so much more that they have to contend with. And we just ask, Lord, that you would give them an extra measure of patience but also compassion and empathy for those kids. We also come before you, Lord, and, 
and we lift up to you our children. Those who are already in college, university, those in high school, elementary school, Lord, as they return, as some are on the bus, as some return in their cars or go to campuses, we just ask, Lord, that you would watch over them, that they would be able to learn, that they would be able to grow. And uh, we just ask in the name of Jesus that you would spare them, Lord, that this virus would not infect them. And for those, Lord, who already are dealing with this virus and struggling across this land, we just ask that soon, very soon, that, Lord, there would be an answer. And we do pray boldly for healing and recovery. But in all of this, Lord, as we pray for our schools and as we pray for our land, we pray as well for the church, for your people, that we would rise up and that we would care for teachers and students, that we would pray for them on a continual basis, whether we have kids in school or not. And so, Lord, teach us to pray. Bring us to our knees on a daily basis. And, Lord, all this we pray in Jesus' mighty name.